Thank you, Carl. That was uh, a very um, kind introduction. And I don't have grandkids for those that call Carl saying my my twin one year old grandkids. Carl has grandchildren that are twins, um, but I have I have twin one year olds. So just wanted to clarify that I'm not a grandfather just yet. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I'm very honored to be on here today. And Melanie, you and your team have been so supportive in getting us the information we need to be successful today. And um, I am really just thrilled. I, I think we have like 1.3K 1. 1. people on here, maybe a little more. And uh, it's exciting to share information, um, put a unique perspective out there, and um, give you all the tools um, and hopefully some inspiration. Um, it's a uh, Operating in the veteran space and the veteran mental health space can be really challenging at times and it can suck the life and the energy out of you. And um, I know for the clinicians on the call and even the non-clinicians and the individuals that provide peer support and volunteer, um, it can be a lot. And um, it just, it's uh, invigorating and exciting to see that we have so many people that are in this together as a team, um, trying to improve the mental health and the well-being uh, of our veterans. So um, I'm going to kick this off. I'm going to share my screen and I just want to do a quick radio check once my screen is shared. Um, Melanie or you or someone from your team can give me a thumbs up and we can um, kick it off. All right. Looks like okay. How are we looking? Yeah, I, I can, can see that. Good. That looks good. Okay, can you hear me good, Melanie? I can hear you great. Um, if anyone's having technical difficulties, you can throw that in the chat. But uh, it's all good to go over here on my end. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so the I'm just pulling up the. Q&A as well, just to be on the lookout. And if anything pops up, Melanie, just let me know. Um, so, okay. So today's keynote will be about veteran health and wellness, uh, a very broad uh, topic. And we'll cover a lot of ground today. And uh, I'm going to move through uh, some topics quickly and then slow down on some topics, depending on how much time we have left. Um, and I might glance over some as well. But I packed today's presentation with a lot of different concepts and ideas and um, I wanted to kick the presentation off with uh, the quote by a great Chinese philosopher um, and thought leader, um, health is the greatest possession. And I uh, say that with the utmost interest in you as a human and what I believe should be your most valuable capability and tool um, for the rest of your life. If you don't have health, you have nothing. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, a lot of different concepts about health and wellness, try to give you unique perspectives and from multiple different angles, because we have clinicians, uh, we have non-clinicians, we have veterans, we have um, administrators on this call, and let's really try to build a well-rounded uh, discussion and to Melanie's point, discourse. I love discourse. Um, I'm only one person, right? And I have only one opinion. There are thousands, millions of different opinions and brilliant thoughts and insights into this world. So um, this is just one small piece of that. So I'm going to kick off with just talking a little bit about myself. Um, so I was born and raised in Carmel, New York, a uh, small town about an hour north of Manhattan. And um, my father was a, a Marine Corps veteran and in the Navy as well. And my grandfathers were uh, in World War II my uncles in Vietnam, my cousins, um, my brother, all military first responders. Um, so my my blood runs red, white, and blue for sure. My father was a New York City firefighter during 9-11 um, uh, and growing up uh, in the household with him being a firefighter, I started getting the early um, signs and indications of what PTS is and, you know, for a first responder and, and a veteran, which he was. Um, so I started really like understanding mental health and wellness at an early age. I just couldn't quite put my finger on what exactly it was. So um, I graduated from high school and I went to the Merchant Marine Academy, uh, which is a, a, one of the five federal service academies. Um, during my time there, I got to sail around the world for a year on ships, uh, both naval vessels and uh, merchant commercial vessels and 
got my first real snapshot of what everything else looks like outside of the bubble that we live in here in the United States. Uh, and then I, um, I played football there and I ran track and then I graduated and commissioned into the Navy and I went right to BUDS, which is um, the ba really like kind of like the basic training for Navy SEALs out in Coronado, California. Um, it's called uh, Basic Underwater Demolition School. And um, that's where you get all the, you know, the infamous Hell Week and, you know, the all the other rigors of training. So I went to BUDS and then um, I graduated, uh, went to my first SEAL team and, um, you know, my NSW career took, Naval Special Warfare career took off from there. Um, and I uh, left the military and got off active duty um, uh, in 2019 and I stayed in the reserves for a bit. And I ended up just totally separating from the military in like 2021, uh, in April or May or something like that. So I left the military and um, the it was almost instantaneous in the transition. And so many of you here on the call uh, feel this uh, transition was really challenging for me. Um, you know, I um, started suffering from, you know, you name it, depression, anxiety, uh, isolation. Um, I was becoming extremely recluse and I was going down a dark path and um, what brought me back to and what, what I what I was reviving myself with was all of the um, elements of our programs at the organization that I run now Guardian Revival. So um, dogs, music, uh, being out in nature and peer support, which is a big, important um, topic that we will talk about for the next two days here. So I left the military. I worked in the corporate world for a little bit, um, and then I started building Guardian Revival, and um, that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, you know, real quick about Guardian: we are uh, we provide non clinical services and support. We have a music program. We have a outdoor adventure program. Think like backpacking, hiking, kayaking, paddling, snowshoeing, those types of outdoor adventures. And then um, we have a peer support program. Uh, and we just stood up a, uh, excuse me, a dog program. And then we also just uh, recently uh, were standing up a family program. So uh, we do a lot of different things for the veteran and first responder uh, space, all focused around mental health and well-being. And then now I am the um, uh, happy father of, of two one-year-old twin boys. My wife is pregnant and um, she's due in May with a, another, uh, with another, um, boy on the way. So we'll have three boys and we'll, we'll see what happens after that. So, you know, you'll see a variation of identity, which we'll get into later. You know, I was a young boy, my father, first responder, I was a Navy SEAL. And now, um, you know, I'm a, a leader in the nonprofit world and a father, most importantly to me. So what is, what is today about? Today is um, really what I believe to be about a couple things, but most importantly, it's about our health and wellness. Um, the term health and the term wellness, the term well-being, right? They all kind of orbit in the same general area, but what it really means is living uh, with happiness, with grace, um, with you know minimal amounts of pain and satisfaction. Uh, to me, health and wellness could be eating right. It could be exercising. It could be sleeping and resting properly. It could be having a healthy social network. It means a lot of different things. Self-awareness. Uh, if you want to grow as a human being and you want to develop yourself professionally and personally, or, or dig yourself out of a hole that you find yourself in, you have to be self-aware and look internal. I believe most of the answers are internal. Um, when you start pointing fingers externally and blaming other things, I think we often can get strayed in the wrong direction um, on our path to healing. Uh, growth and healing, which I just said. Uh, today's about growth and healing. I want you all to leave inspired, whether or not you um, need to apply some of these techniques and information to yourself or your loved ones or your clientele. Uh, growth and healing is a key element of today's discussion. Struggling. We, uh, everyone here on this call, I guarantee it, and I would put money on it, is struggling in some capacity, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. That is um, a fact. We are humans and we will struggle through life. Life is hard. So today we'll be talking about struggling as well. Um, and it will be an underlying tone for the rest of the presentation and connecting. We have to connect as human beings. We are a social species. Uh, it was the, the cooperative capability 
as Homo sapien that allowed us to uh, transcend our uh, paleo ancestors, Cro-Magnum and Homo erectus, who were bigger and stronger than us. We were able to connect and cooperate and communicate more effectively and grow in numbers and size. So let's take advantage of that capability that we have as humans. Um, and then a mindset. So we always, uh, you hear the term mindset, it's abused in so many different ways uh, in a lot of different topics, but you know, the, a mindset to me is it's a it's a loaded word. But at the end of the day, what's going on inside of your head uh, is what drives your your movements, your your gesticulations, the direction that you head in life, the trajectories that you set yourself on. Everything starts in the mind. And if you can develop a strong mindset, you can um, do a lot. And, and I like to say sometimes you're capable of doing anything. And that's inspiring to me. Most importantly, today will be unique. Uh, so I chose not to cite a lot of literature. I chose not to um, run you through a deep level of research or, you know, try to regurgitate um, principles of, of, you know, the, the latest research on mental health for veterans. I want to give you a unique experience. I'm going to go off on a limb a little bit in some areas. I'm going to be a little aggressive in some areas and really challenge us all and, and, and have us question with a unique experience. I am not an expert in, in any of these things. I'm very much a generalist. Um, I don't have a license to practice anything, um, but you know these, these are my opinions, right? Um, and, and strictly my opinions from the experiences that I've had in life and, uh, and accumulation of, of what I believe to be one type of solution or one type of a way to look at this. Um, I, I deeply respect everyone else's opinions and, and considerations um, today. You know, I might take a more uh, bullish approach to health and wellness. Um, you know, it might be a, a little aggressive. Um, I'm putting a lot of ownership on the veterans and on the individual um, to develop their own mindset and capabilities. You know, I don't believe that uh, one clinician or one government agency is going to solve, um, you know, mental health and wellness uh, issues for our veteran population. I believe it's really on the individual veterans that need to grow and develop um, and clinicians and programming and what we do at Guardian Revival and what the Joseph B. Dwyer Vet to Vet program does are, are simply tools and modalities of healing, but you have to get yourself there. You know, we can teach you, you know, how to fish, but you got to get up every day and go out and fish. Um, you know, that's a scary thing, but it's also empowering. So some of the things you'll hear today and some of the things you're hearing out of my mouth right now are very much rooted in um, self-efficacy and self-determination, which are two psychological constructs that you might hear um, as a clinician and, and even as just a, a, a veteran. Um, it's very much ownerships on you. Uh, and uh, it doesn't solve everyone's issues. It's not the only mindset, but it is one mindset. And it's what has allowed me to dig myself out of holes and to support others and to grow others and to lead others. So consider it, take it with a grain of salt. Um, not every word out of my mouth is going to be gospel today, um, but I will open up and I will share my thoughts and, um, and it's going to be uh, really a, a healthy discourse and a balanced discourse. Um, lastly, what I want to say is trauma and mental health challenges have been around since the dawn of humankind. Um, I don't think trauma and mental illness and uh, suicide are things that are new or recent. Um, I think we're just uncovering them more. And I think factors mostly related to, to society at large are exacerbating some of the challenges with these, with these topics. Um, trauma has been around forever. I think humans are built for trauma. Uh, we are so strong and capable as human beings, um, but there's something going wrong. Um, and we'll dive a little bit into that today. So I believe trauma is part of life. Struggling is part of life. There's a really good book uh, written by Ken Faulkner. Uh, it's called Struggle Well. Uh, he's the founder of um, of uh, uh, the Boulder Crest Foundation. Incredible guy. Uh, so um, anyway, so uh, I digress. So we're going to move on and time we're doing pretty good right now. So Three truths I want to leave. I want to start this off with. We all want to be healthy. Um, there's not a single person in this room that does not want to be healthy or somewhat improve their uh, sense of well-being or health. We have all tried to be healthy before. Everyone. They might have eaten, tried to eat differently, tried to expand their social network, tried to sleep better, tried to exercise. We all want to do better. It's inherent to the human condition. We want to improve our position. And then uh, we all have failed before. I have failed countless times 
I can't recall the number of times that I've, you know, the New Year's, the, the typical New Year's resolution. Oh, yeah. Starting January 1st, I'm going to do a number of push ups. I'm going to run 10 miles, all these crazy things you tell yourself. And like two days into it, you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm doing the same thing all over again. So um, bottom line is we all have tried before. We have this natural condition and drive to be healthier. And we've all failed before. Uh, we're in this together, right? So everything I tell you today is not to put anyone down here in this group. I'm speaking alongside you, not speaking at you. Um, I'm going to throw some some statistics and data up there, and some of that some of that might hit you in a certain way. And the intent is not to point out any specific people or identify any specific um, illnesses or conditions of of human. Uh, that you know makes you feel isolated. The idea is just to give you a general oversight. So don't take what I say today as, as personal to you. Stigmas and barriers associated with mental health. I don't need to go deep into this, but we all understand that the military culture drives a set of values that breed self-reliance and tough it out. I don't need help. I'm here to go to war. I'm here to help other people. And um, I don't need I don't need help, right? We see this across many different dimensions, the self, right? How the conversations you have in your head, um, the negative attitudes towards your mental health, trying to tell yourself that you're not having a hard time, you're not struggling, you don't need help. The social aspects, right? Um, I think it, it's really only been recent. You ask a Vietnam veteran, you ask Carl, um, you know, and look at the culture that, you know, VFWs and American legions and just like post Vietnam, post World War II era is you don't talk about your problems. You drink it, you drink you're, you know, you're a man, you're a woman, you're a veteran, and you move on and you go take care of your family, you go to work, and that's it, right? And then professional, this is more related to uh, what I believe more related to the first responder community, but even in the military, uh, if you are on deployment, and you, you know, say I have a problem, uh, you know, you may not be deployable anymore. In the world that I came from the special operations community, um, you know, you're not deployable, you're not operational, if you you are not mentally fit or you're struggling. So uh, there is a huge stigma associated with that. So three types of architects, archetypes that I want to talk about today is um, number one, and this is important because we have so many different people on the call. So I want to, I want to um, respect and I want to consider all the different angles. So the veteran, the veteran is the veteran. And uh, as Melanie said, you've met one veteran, you've met one veteran. Every veteran is unique and different. Um, and that's an important note for the clinicians on the call. Uh, don't ever go into your first session with a veteran and have all these presuppositions about who this veteran is as what, and you know what, what they're going to say and what their experiences are. You will turn in the wrong direction immediately. The healer. So the healer are my clinicians, my non-clinicians, but you know, I consider myself a healer as well, right? I'm focused on improving the mental health and well-being of our veterans. So I have some type of dedication and passion towards helping our veterans. And then the family, not to be confused with caregivers. I believe that is a different concept, but the family, right? Um, we know that families are the direct recipient, recipients of our trauma as veterans, um, and they carry so much. So um, just consider that. Three different angles. There are probably more in here, but these are the three ones that I might uh, reference throughout the, the call today. Reactive versus, pro, uh, re reactive versus preventative and proactive. You'll see a defining health uh, consideration uh, nowadays, which I think is, it, it's, it's, it's very accurate that, you know, all of our problems, uh, they are already problems when we start dealing with them, right? So preventative medicine, being proactive about your health, right? This is the direction we want to head. We don't want to be reactive. We don't want to, you know, oh, now I, you know, I have high blood pressure or now, you know, I, I seem to be developing this, you know, early onset of degenerative disease or some type of um, mental challenge. Uh, and now you're addressing it, right? No, we want to be intelligent. We want to be preventative. We want to access resources early out, right? I do see a change and a, and a direction um, that the community is taking uh, that is being more preventative and proactive. So, Today, you know, I, I wanted to break down what I believe are some defining factors of, of why veterans are, are challenged with the social, uh, emotional, physical, mental, um, you know, uh, disproportionate statistics that we see. We understand, I, I don't need to go into the statistics, we all understand um, veterans have uh, disproportionately higher levels of mental illness and other types of challenges. 
So why is that? So today I'm going to propose three different um, factors. And again, there are so many more. Um, and uh, today I'm going to I'm going to pick three. And those three are the transition. There's no denying it. I think it's roughly 200,000 active duty service members transition out of the military every single year. And I believe that's a function of the Department of Labor. But 200,000 military service members transitioning out. Insane to me. Society. I believe that a lot of our challenges we deal with as a veteran population are really just rooted and exacerbated in in standard conditions that society sets for us, meaning non-veterans deal with these factors as well. You know, I believe that the veteran population is a microcosm of, of society, right? Um, all different shapes, sizes, colors, religions, you know, everything. Uh, so society is another one. And then lastly, unique factors, which is you know, the, the, the area that is a cluster of what we all experience throughout our life and throughout our time and service in a unique manner. So let's talk about the transition. Now, uh, again, I'm, I'm missing a lot of different areas, but I wanted to kind of condense it and talk about four specific areas of transition um, that I believe are important. Now, I use kind of like clinical and, and more uh, sophisticated words um, but the intention is not to um, drive this in a clinical setting. I just think sometimes clinical words say a lot in a little, in a short, in a single word. Um, and I think that they provide you with a very interesting perspective. So um, don't take these words from in a clinical perspective. Take them for the, the meaning and definition of the word itself. And I'll, and I'll talk through them. So identity dysphoria, right? Uh, identity is a huge component of our health and wellness. How do we identify as a person, as a family member, as a veteran, however it may be? So dysphoria in a, in a clinical or professional term really means some state of feeling unhappy, uneasy, dissatisfied, or, or imbalanced, right? So when you transition out of the military, uh, uh, there is a strong sense of identity dysphoria or a strong sense of who am I now? I don't wear a uniform anymore. Um, you know, I got my DD-214. I don't report to anybody. I'm out of this very tightly knit bureaucratic hierarchical construct, and I'm off to the races in the civilian world. Huge dysphoria. In other words, who am I? Purpose delirium. So delirium is really a bit of confusion, disorientation, um, agitation, or another alternative way to say it is wild excitement or ecstasy or very erratic up and down. So what is my purpose after I've left the military from the community that, that I came from? Uh, you know, my purpose was very clear, right? I, all of my training and my entire military career was, um, how to, um, allow me to hunt and capture or kill our enemy overseas. That's literally what my entire purpose was. So if you could imagine leaving the military, like that is not a thing in, in you know, modern society, uh, or at least not what I was dire directing the head to. So purpose delirium. And that another way to describe that is the why, right? What am I doing? Why am I waking up every day? Social degeneration. Again, super fancy word, but in the shortest uh explanation possible it's an abrupt change or excuse me it's a decline or a deterioration right we lose that sense of tribe that sense of com camaraderie when we transition out of the military um and we don't have those social uh networks or that fabric to lean on and rely on when things go go arise um you develop in a almost uh, unachievable uh sensation of, of just trust and and empathy and camaraderie when you're in the military and that all goes away so um with whom is is kind of like the general sense. Who am I associating myself with? Who am I connecting with? And then environmental trans transilience. And transilience is just a fancy word for saying a huge abrupt change or variation in something. So a change in environment. You know, people are walking differently. They're talking differently. They're dressed differently. You are in a whole new environment, right? You, you are being picked up and dropped off into a new environment. And it can be extremely um, off-putting. Uh, and oftentimes you're confused. Um, it's really hard to orient yourself in, in a number of ways. So where am I is the term. And then I th always think about transition and, you know, Carl and other Vietnam veterans who are on the call today, I can't even imagine layering over, you know, th the challenges that you dealt with transitioning out of the uh, military um, in the Vietnam era. Uh, I can't even imagine. So 
Um, my heart is is tenfold uh, more deeper for for your experiences and and um, what you had to deal with. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was society, right? Another key element that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I like to call it the puppet show. It's not a le legitimate term. It's just, to me, a convenient way to describe what I feel like sometimes when I live in 21st century America. Um, uh, so society. Now, I'm going to run through a couple statistics here, and um, they are general statistics that represent the average American, right? This is not everybody. This may be nobody on the call. It could be people on the call, but I'm just going to lay it out. You know, these are um, rooted in legitimate, you know, um, statistics and data and research. So I'm comfortable putting them up here, but, um, you know, here we go. It's going to get a little uh, dark for a second, and I promise you I'll pull us out. So two thirds of Americans are overweight. One in uh, five Americans suffer from some type of diagnosable um, mental illness. Heart disease is the number one cause of death. One in three Americans are considered clinically obese. Seven hours of screen time a day on average is what we as Americans spend. That is very scary. Um, and we have roughly an eight second attention span. I think goldfish are at like a like one or two seconds after us, or they might even have a better attention span. Somebody, somebody fact check that, but, um, and then 90% of our time is spent indoors in a vehicle commuting or at home or in an office, um, really scary statistics on the average American. So I, I bring these up because, uh, again, I say that the veteran population is just a microcosm of society. So our veterans are surely dealing with these things as well, right? They're not in the military anymore. We don't need to hold ourselves to certain physical fitness standards. We're, we're out in the open now. So we're all susceptible to these. So these, uh, you know, aggregate and really um, exacerbate all the other challenges that we deal with. And what is more fascinating is when you look at the market, which tells us a lot of important information, you see this huge growth curve in health and wellness market. Everything from supplements to workout equipment to all different types of things. So the market is a really good indicator of health trends in the United States, um, and it's apparent right now. We all want that fix. We all want that magic pill. We all want that gym membership, right? We all think that there's this thing out there we can buy as a consumer, and it's going to solve all our problems. That's not the case. So uh, just some other ways to frame the puppet show or society is abundance. We live in a world of abundance right now. All of our biological imperatives to you know have sex, to eat food, to burn energy, to uh, socialize with people, we don't need to do that anymore for survival. We are just ripe with uh, abundance every type of abundance. And I believe that is problematic to us if we don't come up with creative ways to um, curve that to our advantage as a species. Addiction, I don't need to say it anymore. Uh, addiction is real and it's something we've all experienced to some extent. Um, and it's a, it's a constant daily battle for, for me. Um, you know, avoiding addictive substances is a daily challenge and uh, we're all susceptible to it. And then alienation. So I believe that the um, this this society is primed in particular for this condition. Uh, it's easier for us to isolate. We don't have to rely on other people. We can um, call up Uber Eats and get our food. We can talk to somebody on on the internet. We don't have to physically be in the presence of somebody else. So it makes it convenient convenient for us to alienate or isolate ourselves, which we are adamantly familiar with as an early indicator of suicidal ideation. Other areas to consider, consumption, right? We just consume so much as humans, um, all these different substances, and that can be a real, um, that can be deadly to us as not just individuals, but as a species. Sedentation, right? Again, back to the food delivery. Um, most of our work is done virtually. We're sitting in a chair like I am right now. I'm talking on a computer. Uh, we have all these different um, wonderful inventions that make us have to move less. We are such a sed sedentary species now when we were designed to be on the move all the time. Comfort, uh, you know, everything like all these cool technological advances, um, new chairs, all different types of widgets, they're all designed to create comfort. You know, it's, it's not often that we find ourselves in extreme temperatures. We can go into AC or we can, you know, turn on the heat. That wasn't always the case in, in, in our evolutionary history. And, and I believe that plays an important role 
um, for our health and wellness. So we, we don't, we're like more and more comfortable, right? And when you're not comfortable, or when you're comfortable, you don't grow, or it's a lot harder to grow. Uh, unique factors. Uh, you know, this is the third area. So we all have a unique story. Um, and I like to say that nobody can take your trauma from you. And it's, I, I say that um, with a caveat, and that is um, not literally, but nobody knows what you've been through and your trauma is your trauma and your trauma is um, unique to you. And nobody can tell you your trauma is not worthy or, you know, they can't compare your trauma with their trauma. That's where you go. That's where you just separate yourself from even understanding the basis of, of how to, how to help your own uh, health and well-being. So um, unique factors, trauma itself, childhood, uh, childhood experiences, early stages of development uh, really play an important role in the development of our psychology, personal capabilities and limitations, uh, socioeconomics, environment, service, your time and service, and then the home front, um, what's going on at home with your family life, right? So these are all unique factors that um, create um, a unique picture that either drives your health and wellness in the right direction or, or down a darker path. So I talked about mindset earlier, and I will double down in saying that uh, I believe that our the the discourse we're on today is really talking about mindset and how to look at this um, mental health and well being trend that we're experiencing as society, but as veterans. Um, and mindset really is everything. Um, so I wanted to bring up a couple common threads, and, and for my clinicians here, my healers, understand that. At some point in time, the veteran that's walking uh, through the door uh, is has been to boot camp or some type of rigorous or high intensity training. We've all had that. That is a common thread. It could be OCS. It could be uh, an academy. It could be buds. It could be you know basic training. But as veterans, we all were pushed through this pipeline, which I believe tells us that at some point in our life, we've had a higher level of resilience than the average American, a higher level of discipline than the average American, and then a, a greater sense of passion. In order to sign your name on the dotted line, right, and be willing to sacrifice your freedoms and, and even your life and your safety for the greater good requires a level of passion. So like veterans on this call, we have these tools, like more so than the average American. So let's let's use them. That's why I'm okay with being a little hard on on you know my veterans that I associate with is because you guys have these tools. Let's use them. So moving on the mindset. So uh, I'm just going to rip through these real quick. But we had that New Year's resolution mindset. Put off today what you can do tomorrow. There's some magic pill. And I put all these things on the screen because at some point in time, it has been through my head before. I'm not speaking on behalf of a friend. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. So these are just excuses that come into our head. Next year, I'll do it. Tomorrow, after the holidays, after my birthday, next month, when things calm down, when I have time, when I get this thing or when this happens, right? Pills, shakers, powders, shots, drinks, apps, wearables, routines, Memberships, books, checklists, gear, clothing, shoes, straps, routines, sales, equipment, pre-workouts, post-workouts, music, coaches, grips, therapeutics. There are so many things out there, but none of those things uh, are tied to you and your mindset, right? Like these are all external things that you can augment a mindset with. So just don't forget that you can create all these expectations that if you get this thing or that thing that you're going to somehow like achieve a better state of mind or a better sense of well-being. That's not true. It all starts with you. And how does this work out for us, right? I buy that thing. I get a gym membership. I end up not going, right? I've done that before. So um, I'm going to play a quick video. And um, this is a very powerful video to me. Can somebody say in the chat while this plays that you can see it and hear it? Greatness. It's just something. Um, you may need to click the uh, share computer oh, sound button. So if you see view options and then. Uh, 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 Got it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Let's try again. I'm going to turn on subtitles.
greatness. Spanish. It's just something we made up. Hopefully you guys speak Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few. For prodigies. For superstars. And the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. All of us. All right. So, um, very powerful video and fires me up on so many different levels. Um, I like this video of all videos brings tears to my eyes because this kid in who knows where Nebraska, you know, if fell in the blank, it could be anyone. You see this in third world countries. You see somebody that has very, very little, but is somehow managing to rise above. And, you know, I have, so, I am so privileged and I have so many resources and support and, and a network. And I'm so blessed and I have so much. And I find myself sometimes struggling to wake up or to go get a workout in or something like that. So um, just understand that we are so capable as humans and no matter where you are in, in the food chain or no matter what you're dealing with and what your access to resources is, you always have this and nobody can take that away from you. So what I think is the the um, antithesis of this is a victimization mindset. And the idea that you're a victim in a scenario or in a situation, and please don't mistake in the term victimization as, as the uh, more appropriate for professional and clinical term. I'm talking about a general mindset of, you know, uh, I'm victim to something, right? Let's flip that and turn that around um, because when you victimize yourself, you lose control. So don't lose control, maintain control. Um, and it's a it's a paradox, right? Because sometimes you have to let go and let others control you, but it's more on your own terms and conditions. Um, and it's it's more in like a um, in a in a literal sense. So just understand that. Don't victimize yourself. You're more capable than you know. Prioritize. In order to be healthier, you have to um, you have to prioritize your health and wellness. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So prioritize for those that need a refresher it means the designator treats something as more important than other things. So if you watch an hour of Netflix every night and you don't work out and you're wondering why you're not able to improve your health and wellness, well, you're not prioritize you're prioritizing Netflix, right? I mean, we all love Netflix here, right? But seriously, get outside and walk or re or shuffle the deck, right? Prioritize or put health at the bottom at the base and everything else comes after that. Don't forget that. Um, one more funny I'm going to be your instincts. Kunu will be your instincts. Don't do anything. Don't try to surf. Don't do it. The less you do, the more you do. Let's see it pop up. Pop it up. That's not it at all. Do less. Get down. Try less. Do it again. Pop up. Nope. Too slow. Do less. Pop up. Pop up. Too, you're doing too much. Do less. Pop down. Pop up now. Stop. Get down. Get down there. Remember, don't do anything. Nothing. Pop up. Well, you no, you got to do more than that because you're just laying. You, right, looks like you're boogie boarding. Just do it. Feel it. Pop up. Yeah, that wasn't quite it, but we're going to figure it out out there. Let's go surfing. Come on. Everybody's learning how. Come on. Uh, the weather outside. All right. So <laughs> for those that have seen Forgetting Sarah Marshall, absolutely hilarious. But um, the idea is uh, the doing paradox. Again, I don't know if this is a legitimate thing. I haven't looked it up, but we're often so front sight focused on doing more, thinking that that's going to get us in a better place. Um, and I understand that, right? We're like, I need to work out more. I need to do more of these things. I need to eat more of this, or I need to think more like this, right? And I would 
challenge you to, to oftentimes do the opposite, do less, eat less of that bad thing, you know, that's, um, bad for you, right? Drink less of that substance that you know is not good for you, right? So identify the things in your life that you can get out and just shed and burn that burn that stuff, throw it in the fire and get rid of it and shed that weight. And then you can start building your confidence up and doing little little things and taking things more things on on your plate, right? Knock out that stuff that you know you want to do away with first and then do more things. Um for the uh, yeah, we're going to play this one. Let's just do it. We got time. Oops. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can hear it and see. Anybody speak German? I don't know what that says, but um, yeah, there's a there's a little dust in the room here. I'm not crying, I swear. Um, so uh, let's get one word in the chat of what that video meant to you. One word. Yes. Remember that little thing that I talked about earlier, purpose? Um, the why. Why? Why do you wake up in the morning? Right? And there was a certain point in time in my, in my period where I struggled, where I was having a hard time answering that question. And you have to do some digging and you have to search. So... As long as you have a why, why you wake up in the morning, it could be for a dog, it could be for a family member, it could be to help somebody else. Um, find that why and just hold on to that why and don't let it go because that why is going to keep you um, stable and keep you safe during the storm and when you know the seas get rocky. And uh, it could be anything, right? And and oftentimes people's why usually is something like. Um, you know, for a family or for love or to help others. And and that to me is a clear indicator of who we are as a species and what really makes us tick is helping others, being around others and loving people. So don't forget that. All right. 
I'm not going to play this video uh, because it's a little too long. Um, but the idea behind this video is that our little small decisions accumulate and lead to larger lifestyle changes. Don't short the little decisions. The little tiny decisions are the ones that really lead to large lifestyle changes. Again, there's not one pill. There's not one major decision, iconic defining decision that you made in your life that I'm going to go this direction versus that direction. It's a lot of little decisions. So focus on these little tiny decisions on a daily basis, and then you will be more effective. I guarantee it. Bite-sized pieces. So we are running low on time, and uh, you know I'm going to bounce through this. I guess I'm going to stop here for a second. Uh, Melanie, um, what are your thoughts on just continuing with, continuing with the presentation or opening up for q and A? Is um, Can we do like a, a Democratic vote on that or? I mean, uh, I, think um, the, I think so. Two uh, things. I, one, um, Michelangelo Albanese. One, uh, Michelangelo Albanese said that that German translation is for the things that matter. He hmm. put that in the the chat. So thank you, uh, thank you, Michelangelo, for sharing that with us. Um, a lot of people are asking if you will be able to provide the links to all these inspirational videos. Um, we could include those on the supplemental materials and. Um, if you guys have questions, please put them in the chat. So, um, okay, a lot of people are saying continue. If the if the if the chat fills up with Q and A, then obviously we should be doing that. But okay, okay, everyone wants you to continue. Nobody has questions. <laughs> Everyone's just enamored. Um, All right. Okay, perfect. So All right, let's, cool. let's All continue. Right, we'll keep... If anyone has questions for Alex. Put them in the chat. Um, Alex, will you be share? Will you be able to share this particular presentation? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll share it. You can send it out to everybody. There's okay, not so, thing that's. So then we'll we'll include this presentation and the links um, after the conference. So if you have other questions for Alex about his experience, about what he's talking about, please put those in the chat uh, in the Q and A, and he'll answer those. And then I guess since there are no. Q and A right now. Um, feel free, yeah. Feel free to to close it out. Go right up until eleven. All right, let's Excellent. do it. Onward, Charlie, Mike. All right, so take your meds every day. Um, uh, kind of a crafty little um acronym that you can use to check yourself. Um, again, health and wellness covers a broad spectrum of things, but think about taking your meds every single day and run through this little checklist in your head. Uh, to help you hold yourself accountable. So the first thing is um, mindfulness, right? M for mindfulness. Mindfulness is a, it can be a woo-woo word. It can be a word that expands into yoga and all different types of eye rest and other types of, of um, you know, could be like religious type activities. But really being mindful in its simplest ways is just being in the present, right? Being able to touch, to listen, to taste, to smell, to hear, using your five senses and just being in the moment, right? We live an extremely fast-paced life. Um, so taking a breath and being mindful in whatever capacity is extremely important. Uh, the thing I like, uh, the analogy that I like to say, and uh, for some people it's awkward, but like for those that like you forget your phone before you go to the bathroom, sit down on the toilet. Does anyone else want to be honest and raise their hand that they feel like they are um, you know, feeling that they're missing something. I do. I'm like, where's my phone? Um, so just don't forget that. Be mindful. Exercise. I don't care what you do. You don't have to do CrossFit. You don't have to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, you don't have to run. Just start, just move, move. And that's all I'm asking of you to do. It could be a walk. It could be bicep curls. It could be anything. So just move. Don't stop moving. Never stop moving. Diet. Uh, Extremely political place to talk. I will leave it at this. Understand everything that you put in your body and treat it with respect. Read the back of, of every type of ingredient that you're putting in your body. Be informed. Be well-rounded. Don't just pick one diet. Consider all options. Um, and and just, just understand what you put in your body. And just uh, being aware of what you put in your body, I believe, will automatically help you make better food decisions. Sleep. I don't need to say anything else. Sleep uh, is so important. One of the most important things, figure out a way to sleep better. There is so much information online. Figure out a way to sleep better. Um, 
get off your phone 30 minutes before you go to sleep. Don't fall asleep with the TV on, right? Optimize the temperature in your room. Manipulate your environment as much as you can to sleep better. And then social, connect with people. Do not isolate. Whatever you do, do not isolate. Even if it's painful to talk to people, I am I am recluse in nature and I am an uh, introvert. Talk to people and get out there and stick your neck out there, even if it's uncomfortable. I promise you there are, are sub subconscious and um, things that are happening underneath the surface that you can't even feel that are good when you socialize with people. Leadership. All right. We got 10 minutes. We're going to keep moving through this. Leadership is a word that uh, uh, is, is abused, I believe. And um, we like to say leadership, but do we truly understand what leadership is? And, and what I want to share with you is one perspective of leadership, and it simply boils down to influence. I believe that leadership is just influence. If you look at the definition of leadership in some type of um, uh, a scholarly article or in a textbook, it says something along the lines of an individual uh, influencing a group of people to achieve a common goal or objective, right? So understand that we have to influence as human beings, uh, ideally positively influence people. And that really is leadership in its simplest terms. Uh, we've all heard that you don't have to be at the top of the food chain or be a boss or be at the top of the hierarchy to be a leader. No, 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 no. Some of my greatest leadership lessons I've learned and some of the most powerful people that have influenced me were the people at the very bottom of the chain. Point in case is that young, you know, ne corn fed Nebraskan boy who was running, you know, out on the road at 5 a.m. in the morning with, you know, a handy down sneakers. So keep that in mind that little kid in, influenced me more so than many of the leaders I've had in the military. Good leadership. Um, I want us all to think for a second about a good leader they've had and why they um, why they were a good leader to you, right? How do they positively influence you? And then conversely, bad leadership. Uh, we all have had bad leaders before. Consider why they were negatively influencing you or what it was that you didn't like. Um, and, and my advice to you is if you are in a leadership position or you're trying to lead more positively influence people, which huh, no secret, everyone on this call should be, uh, uh, is can just learn from your bad experiences and your good experiences and try to emulate those positive leadership attributes for the good leaders you've had. And then the bad leaders try to avoid those characteristics. So how can you be a better leader? There's so many ways to look at this. There's so many theories and models of leadership, authentic leadership, transformative leadership. I mean, I could go down a long list, but how can I be a better leader? I got something simple for you. Be really good at the basics. In the military, in the special operations community is a SEAL. Everyone, you know, idolizes us and says that we're like superhuman. No, we're not. We're tripping over shit on deployment, on a on a patrol. We're stepping in in, in something, um, you know, we're not these superhuman people. We're just really good at the basics and we get really good at the basics to no surprise because we train, 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 and we practice, practice, practice. So get really good at the basics. And I'm going to give you a set of basic principles that you can take with you to be a better leader. And guess what? They're not these magnificent, super sophisticated things are really simple because the basics of good leadership are the same as being a good human, a good friend, a good coworker, and a good family member. So my basics for you all are this, master your emotions, right? A lot of us have a lot going on inside, but if you can master your emotions and and mitigate or at least manage the external manifestations of your internal emotions, you will be a better leader and be better off. Listen, listening is a powerful capability that uh, I think we need to do more of. Um, be on receive mode more. And I promise you, you will learn more than you ever have. If you're always talking and you're always pushing out information and preparing for the next thing you're going to say in a conversation, you're not going to pick up on the little things and be predictable. The best, the best leaders that I've ever had are predictable, meaning I know generally what their behaviors are, what their values are, what they're going to say. You have to be predictable on the battlefield. That's so important. You can't have these these radical decisions and changes in momentum on the battlefield, you have to be predictable. Um, you know, the American war machine has to be have has to be predictable internally, not to our enemies, obviously. So just consider it. Master your emotions. And again, you guys are going to get all this so you can refer back to this, right? Recognize if you feel everyone has uh, early indicators and symptoms of 
you know, they, you start getting emotional, your face could get flush, your hands could get sweaty, whatever it may be. Um, recognize it, right? Learn and recognize the signs and symptoms for you. Remove yourself from the situation. Maybe not literally, but you might have to take a little mental hiatus and change the subject, right? It's better than blowing up in front of somebody. Recenter yourself, right? Whether you have to leave the room and come back literally or figuratively, realign yourself. You're not getting shot at, you know, your life's not at risk. Um, contain yourself and recenter and revisit. And then lastly, reflect, understand that cycle that you find yourself in. We all find ourselves, we're all emotional and emotions are so important. They drive most of our decisions on a daily basis. And just understand that you need to reflect on these and be more self-aware from our, the beginning of our um, conversation. Listen, so the, the uh, little acronym I have for you is RED, right? So respect, listening shows respect, and that is reciprocal, right? We all know those those people in our life that are good listeners, and man, they are powerful, right? I would argue that a lot of the therapeutic benefits of seeing a clinician or getting therapy is really just somebody listening to you and you being able to share your story. If you can learn to listen, you are powerful and you will be a much better healer. Empathy, right? We all need to empathize more with others. We have to consider what somebody else might be feeling or going through, right? That empathy is such a powerful tool. It takes a lot of energy, right? And you can't always do it, but when you can do it, you can draw yourself closer to people, big, build more passionate and, um, you know, stronger relationships. And it can really yield, um, a lot for you as a human being, um, details, um, the, the little, the devil's in the details, right? We've all heard that before. Understand that again, if you, if you, like I have, um, I have had people that have worked together for years and they don't know what the name of their children are, right? So like there's little details that you can pick up just by listening instead of always being on transmit mode. And lastly, be predictable. So consistency, predictability, and reliability, CPR, if you didn't pick up on that, is uh, a great thing to consider when you're a leader. Try to be predictable in your behaviors if you can. Try to, um, you know, whether you're you're new in your leadership role or you've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, try to be predictable, right? Try to generally provide the individuals that you influence up, down, laterally, whatever it may be, with a, a certain level of consistency and predictability. Um, and that will go a long way because how we cooperate and how we work better together is we can sometimes read each other without even speaking, right? I mean, we've all heard of the nonverbal communication um, you know, stats and whatever, 90% of it's nonverbal, whatever it may be. We have an innate ability as humans to connect and communicate with each other without even saying a word. So being predictable will allow people to work off of you and work better with you. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, and it doesn't say the end, obviously. It says the beginning, a big surprise. But I, I want you all, you know, my ask for you all is to treat today like a, a, a starting point, right? You have so much opportunity as a human being. If you are breathing, you it's let's get to work, help yourself and then focus on helping others. There are so many people in this world that need help, not just veterans, everybody around you, clean yourself up, fix your work, work on getting yourself to a better position and then go out and help others. And you can do this, both of them simultaneously. They complement one another. Um, so this is the beginning for you all. Um, and I'm, I, uh, you know, we don't have time for questions, but um, I, uh, I'm very grateful to speak to all of you, give you some type of information, take what you thought was valuable uh, and what you think you could carry with you. And then the things that you're like, and eh, that's not for me, you know, put it on the side or tuck it away for a rainy day and reconsider it. You know, that's all I ask. So um, that is all I have. Uh, I thank you all for the time and opportunity um, some wonderful energy on the chat. And um, I look forward to maybe meeting you all some in person someday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. All right. Um, Alex's uh, nonprofit Guardian Revival is linked in some of the answers. Um, and we're going to take a 10 minute break so you can all decompress and absorb that like immensely wonderful keynote. And then we'll be back for the first panel of the day. All right, so you don't have to log out. You can just, um, just you know, hang out. We're just, our screens are gonna be silent for the next 10 minutes. All right, see you guys back here at 11.10.